welcome back to London Conference, the third day of London Conference 2020. Uh, I hope everybody's doing all right. I think this session is going to be wonderful. I'm Kate Spiliopoulos, Head of Events at Centre for London. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. As a reminder, if you're tweeting about this event or anything else you're seeing at London Conference, use the hashtag LONCONF20. That's L-O-N-C-O-N-F 20. Uh, since we're not using Zoom this morning, as we are for our other sessions, uh, the chair for this session, James Crabtee, will be taking audience questions for the minister through Slido. The link to that Slido is in your uh, morning joining instructions that you should have received this morning. And it's also on the MailChimp uh, landing page and in the YouTube stream, so it should be available to you. Use Slido to ask questions. We're so excited and proud this morning to have Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang here with us. And to introduce her, I would like to welcome Session Chair, who is currently Professor of Practice at Lee Kuan Yew School of Policy in Singapore, former FT journalist and current Netflix star. You can catch him on Bad Boy Billionaires of India. Very varied career, James Crabtree. James, welcome to the London Conference stage. Thank you very much, Kate. It's great to be here. So good afternoon from Singapore. Good morning in London. Good afternoon to Audrey in Taipei. Uh, so we're here this afternoon to talk to Audrey about a range of topics, digital democracy, the, the, the pandemic as it has uh, worked out from, from Asia, uh, protest movements, open government, uh, and what all this means for cities and what London and Taiwan and Taipei can learn from one another. Uh, Audrey, if I can ask her to uh, hold up the mask that she has in her hand, is going to demonstrate uh, that Taiwan is in fact a, a highly functioning society because Audrey has just been to a real live in-person uh, gay pride march in Taipei this afternoon. So uh, Taiwan is working sufficiently well that you can actually have mass public gatherings, which in soon to be locked down London, I suspect might be a somewhat chastening experience. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk for about 45 minutes. As Kate said, please do ask questions. We'll leave time at the end of the session uh, to ask questions to Audrey. I, I want to ask her about uh, Taiwan's record during the pandemic, about her passion for digital government, which is uh, what she does as a minister um, and has been passionate about even before her career in politics as a, as a coder and technology specialist. Uh, I want to talk about urban governance and a whole range of other things besides, including uh, diversity uh, and equality. Um, but Audrey, I think I have to start with uh, the news of the day, if, if you don't mind. So everyone is obsessively looking at Twitter and trying to work out what's going to happen in the United States. This election is very consequential for Taiwan, given its um, central relationship with Washington vis-a-vis um, -vis Beijing. Can you just tell me, I mean, what are people watching it very closely over there? Does, does the does the people in Taiwan have a particular hope for the outcome of this election or, or how does it look from where you are? Well, quite fortunately, um, there's a 12 hour difference uh, between the US East Coast and Taiwan, uh, which means that we will just go to sleep today and wake up knowing more about the result tomorrow. Um, and so the, the most of the nail biting uh, in the US, especially on the East Coast, is going to occur uh, in Taiwan time tonight. Um, and so um, we're, we're, I think, spared of a lot of the nail biting. Uh, now to answer your question more, more directly, um, I think Taiwanese people are aware that in the past four years uh, during the Trump administration, there's uh, a lot more strategic clarity when it comes to Taiwan's role in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and we also see a lot of not only the NDI, the National Democratic Institute, but IRI, its Republican equivalent, the German Swedish Norman Foundation, Reporter Without Borders, Freedom, um, uh, the Oslo Freedom Forum, you name it, uh, being headquartered either move from Hong Kong to Taiwan or just started uh, its headquartered regionally uh, in Taiwan. So that's clarity, Taiwan's democratic achievements, and our way of saying no to the false dilemma of public health on one side and human rights on the other, or uh, the pro-social social media on one side uh, and freedom of speech on the other. We managed to keep both ends thriving. And that message we sent to Indo-Pacific with the help, of course, from the administration uh, in the US. And I firmly believe, um, no matter what the result of the election is, uh, the next administration uh, will continue this relationship with Taiwan um, because uh, both sides have identified quite clearly during their campaigns. 
Okay, very good. Well, so let's um, let's put our American friends uh, and their dysfunction to one side and, and, and look instead at the highly functional reaction that Taiwan has had to the pandemic. Um, I mean, arguably the most effective response of any country in the world. Um, I mean, maybe for those in the audience who are just not that familiar with Taiwan, could you give a, a kind of pen portrait of what it was that, that Taiwan did right. And given that your particular responsibility and enthusiasm is for technology and digital government, what role did that play in the way that Taiwan has handled COVID-19? Um, the digital is purely a assistive role. The most important technology to counter the pandemic is definitely chemical, namely soap and alcohol hand sanitizers. And uh, next to it, uh, the physical vaccine, um, masks. Uh, but digital does help uh, in a way to spread a message about the correct use of masks uh, and hand sanitation. So this is our official spokesdog for our Central Epidemic Command Center. Name is Song Chai, a Shiba Inu. And this dog is now telling you, you wear a mask, protect your own face against your own unwashed hands. It's an extremely effective um, um, idea that's worth spreading because it appeals to rational self-interest. It doesn't say anything about protecting your elders. It doesn't say anything about respecting your community. It says, you know, you, you don't wash your hands with soap? Well, wear a mask to prevent yourself from touching your own face. And, and this idea really went viral. Uh, on the social media. And also when we introduce physical distancing, when you're outdoor, keep two Shiba Inus away. And if you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away. Again, very easy to remember. Um, and so we, we have a word for it, actually. It's called humor over rumor. Um, and so in the very beginning, uh, we saw that during the pandemic, what was really the difficulty in encountering the pandemic is actually the twin of the pandemic, the infodemic. Because when people buy into conspiracy theories and buy into the fear, uncertainty, and doubt as um, you know, um, uh, amplified by the anti-social media, I was trying to not to use that word, but anyway, by the anti-social media platforms, um, then it becomes almost impossible for, for science uh, to thrive. So from the very beginning, we adopted a communication strategy based on the daily live press conferences of the medical offices, based on the 1922 hotline where anyone can call and get their scientific questions answered. But even more crucially, if they have something that our scientists have no answers about, if they report a genuinely new situation on the ground, then the 1922 will also escalate it within minutes to the Central Epidemic Command Center. For example, back in April, uh, in the 1922, there was a young boy calling into the uh, command center saying, oh, you're rationing out masks. And I, all I get, the young boy in primary school said, all I get is pink medical mask. I don't want to wear pink medical mask. My classmates will laugh at me. The very next day on 2 p.m. sharp, all the medical officers, including the health minister, wore pink medical mask. Uh, and the minister even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero. Uh, and so the boy became the most hip boy in the class because only he has the color that the heroes wear. Not just heroes, but the heroes' heroes. So the idea here is to show a real quick iterative cycle where any good idea from the collective intelligence gets amplified. And in that way, because it's fun, it goes viral, all the popular social media brands colored their own icons and avatars pink uh, that week. Uh, and so that spread the scientific messages much easier and also much more accurately than any top-down measures would. Can you say a little bit more about, so you're an enthusiast for open data um, and, and the role that that government can play in, in that respect. And I know that, that making public information available on mask locations and, and things like that was a, a part of what people looked at as part of Taiwan's success. So just say a little bit about that side of things um, as well. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, people keep saying it's my idea. It's not my idea. Uh, around the end of January, uh, there was a person who was named Wu Zhangwei, Howard Wu, uh, the head of the Google Developer Group in Tainan City, a southern city of Taiwan, who gets fed up with the line messages. It's like WhatsApp, uh, but with more stickers. Uh, the line messages uh, that keep saying that, oh, this 
store has run out of mask. There's stores that have some mask left. Um, For those of you who may be able to hear us but no longer see us, so um, even when you're you're uh, you're talking to Asia's leading technology politician, then the technology gremlins can get in our way. But we were talking, Audrey, about open data uh, and the extent to which that that was sort of interesting part of the pandemic response in Taiwan and elsewhere. In part, I think because in previous pandemics um, that had hit Asia during SARS. And elsewhere, there was an accusation that governments had basically hidden the scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the things interesting about COVID-19 was how open almost all the governments in the region have been, all the democratic governments in, in particular, about the nature and scale of the problem. And I, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about how that worked in Taiwan. No, certainly. So as I was mentioning, Howard Wu from Tainan City devised this way to crowdsource a map where uh, his friends and families can pin on um, particular places in the map whether there is still mask in stock or not. Uh, because there's rumor that says, you know, people are stockpiling masks and so on, and he wants to put an end to it, at least for his vicinity and friends and families. Well, the thing is that he appeared on national news, so everybody is using his app. Uh, and the next thing he know, after returning from lunch, he owed Google 20K US dollars in API usage fees. So he has to take the web service down and ask the GovZero community, the G0V community, Taiwan's leading civic technology movement, uh, what to do. Um, and of course, when, when people in OpenStreetMap and other communities started to help him, I'm also on that chattering. So I showed his work to the head of the cabinet, to our premier, and said, we need to do a reverse procurement, meaning that they already have the spec. They already wrote the app. And we need to keep the resource running, namely publishing the real-time availability of all the medical mask uh, shops, uh, all the pharmacies and so on, every 30 seconds, a open API. And that really enables people who queue in line to participate in the accountability audit. That is to say, if I'm an adult, well, I am an adult, using my national health insurance card, um, then people would expect that every two weeks at a time, uh, I would get maybe nine uh, medical masks. And people queuing after me can actually see me swipe my IC card and see the availability decrease by nine. And so everybody understands that this is a fair distribution. Or when it is unfair, if, for example, the people in rural places would take more time on public transportation to get to the pharmacies, it gets to the uh, parliamentary interpolation immediately. Um, the MP Gao Hong An, um, she was a VP of data analytics at Foxconn, so knows something about data. Uh, she says uh, to the Minister Chen Shizhong, based on OpenStreetMap data, that the distribution looks fair on distance, but it's not fair on time. Uh, and the minister Chen did not defend the policy at all. Uh, he simply said, a legislator teach us. And we started co-creating. And the very next day, we introduced pre-ordering and 24-hour pickup from convenience stores and a more uh, fair rationing strategy. And so this is really trusting the citizen and the social sector to co-create the entire distribution mechanism with the key uh, real-time auditability. Very good. I want to sort of take a bit of a step back. So again, many of other people in the audience may be less familiar with Taiwan and its politics than uh, than than certainly you are. Um, could could you just give a sense of how you yourself got into to politics? So your your party is the on you know is has a particular position in in Taiwanese politics, um, but you have a particular background as well in, in technology. How, how did you come to be Taiwan's digital minister? What was your path there for those uh, who yeah, haven't I'm, met? I'm, I'm nonpartisan. I am not any party member. But when you say my party, I did publicly um, endorse a new party uh, that set up uh, just last year. It's called a very happy party, or, or I think the official okay. English name is Can't Stop This Party. Um, and it's founded by quite a few popular YouTubers and comedians, uh, very fun people. Uh, and their party logo is the YouTube logo, but with the triangle pointing downwards. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, it's not the ruling party. It only has one seat in the Taipei City Council. Uh, and in any case, I'm not a party member. Uh, and so my point uh, in working with the politics uh, is not working for the government. I never work for the government. I work with the government. In the same vein, I don't work for the people. I work with the people. The, the core tenet is what I learned when I dropped out of middle school when I was 14 years old, saying that, hey, I want to learn from the World Web. And the head of my school says, OK, go ahead with it. I will fake the record for you with my blessings. Uh, and so the uh, things that I learned is internet governance, the core of internet governance, which is rough consensus, running code, citizen participation, 
things like that. And it turns out that these also work on a day-to-day -day fashion in day-to-day -day democracy. When we occupied the parliament in 2014, um, non-violently for three weeks and deliberated with 20 NGOs, all live streamed, half a million people on the street, many more online, we managed to get pretty good consensus about, for example, not allowing any uh, People's Republic China regime components in our then new 4G network, a debate that everybody else is now having in 5G. We kind of had that when we occupied the parliament and many more um, besides. And so because of that, I think participatory democracy has always been in Taiwan's roots because our first presidential election was in 1996, which is the year that the World Web went popular. And so for us, it's never just about uploading three bits per person every four years, which is called voting, but about more day-to-day -day engagement. What, um, I mean, so you, Taiwan in general has a reputation, and you in particular, for uh, promoting a quite radical vision of participatory democracy, some of which is online and, and some of which is not online. Uh, I want to say a little bit more about that for countries in the West who, I mean, not thinking again about our American cousins, but also in the UK who are anxious about the state of, of our democracies um, and looking for new ideas about how they might be reinvigorated. What, what, what can be learned from Taiwan's experiment from the 2014 Sunflower Revolution through until today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the three pillars I just mentioned, fast, fair, and fun, they can be learned kind of quite independently of each other. A fast iteration, where in Taiwan, our top epidemiologist, the person who wrote the epidemiology textbook uh, during the COVID, when he wanted to talk to the vice president, he just looked into the mirror. It's the same person. Um, and so because of that, our scientific authority and the political authority is the same one. And uh, the daily responses, the fast responses, the collective intelligence, that could be adapted quite easily, actually, just by arranging daily press conference and a hotline and a call center, right? The fair part, again, open API, it's not hard to copy. Um, a, a few young people, um, the youngest, I think, just 14 years old from South Korea, convinced their government to adopt mass rationing using the API designed by people in Tainan City in Taiwan. I think the Finjian Kiang uh, map, uh, the Tainan hackers map, is the first one that worked for Koreans. And even though the Finjian Kiang didn't speak Korean, he speaks JavaScript. Uh, and so as long as they conform to that application programming interface, mass rationing works perfectly well in South Korea. So that's the fair distribution part. And finally, the fun part, humor over rumor. Again, that's a playbook that uh, many different jurisdictions can uh, take a page of. The idea is just make fun of ourselves. It's not about making fun of other people. So it's inclusive humor, and that always travels faster than the disinformation that travels on outrage. Because uh, if you have watched the film Inside Out, uh, if you have something that is anger that could uh, turn to a revenge or a disc uh, discrimination, if you bring the co-creation, the joy, the humor part out, then it goes to the joy, the, the uh, light yellow um, color, and it doesn't go back because in the mind, the pathway only go one way. So if within the same day, before someone goes to sleep, um, something they're upset about uh, is uh, turned into a humorous message. Uh, they will go to sleep waking up, remembering something humorous, and therefore much more pro-social and able to then engage in rational civic discussion. Very good. Well, you're, I'm sure you're speaking to preaching to the gallery at the Center for London, which is an institution that believes in bringing the joy back into politics in all of its forms. But um, uh, rather than rather than humor, I wanted to turn to philosophy. So unusually for a politician, you have a, a personal philosophy which you describe as conservative anarchism, which on the face of it seems a peculiar combination. But I wonder, could you explain what you mean by this as a guiding philosophy and maybe give our audience a, an example or two of how you put it into practice as digital minister. Certainly. So a, a anarchist, is, of course, is someone who does not give command nor receive command, who doesn't believe in coercion and only believes in deliberation. That is what unifies anarchists of all manners. Uh, and a conservative is someone who respects the traditions, who wants the grandparents, grandparents' um, ideas to make some sense uh, in the current situation, who don't want to destroy uh, any of the 
Taiwan's 20 national languages and therefore more than 20 cultures uh, in the name of any particular culture's idea of progress. Uh, and so these two taken together, I think in the East Asian context, I'll just say Taoism, uh, which everybody would understand. But Taoism in Western context is maybe more like a spiritual thing or a religion thing and not a political philosophy, but really it's the same thing as Taoism. Very good. And one, one final question, if you don't mind me asking. So one, one of the things that you're known for as a politician is you're one of the most senior, most visible trans politicians in uh, in Asia. Uh, I mean, could you say a little bit about the kind of you've been on the Pride March this afternoon. Could you say a little bit about the culture of diversity in Taiwan that that has um, a, a kind of the in, into into which you have fitted, as it were, and, and you, you've prospered? Yeah. I mean, the, the Paiwan indigenous nation, uh, which I think our president Tsai Ing-wen shares some of their lineage, uh, doesn't make a, a gender uh, discrimination when it comes to leadership. Um, the uh, Amis indigenous nation, uh, which our presidential spokesperson Gula Siotaka uh, is uh, a nation member, um, is actually a matriarchy. Uh, and so um, there's 20 national languages. 16 indigenous culture, actually more. Uh, and many of them have the idea of more than two genders. Uh, and so if you're in a transcultural republic, uh, then the idea of gender being not strictly binary is, is kind of normal. Uh, I personally spent uh, the days uh, after I dropped out of middle high um, in indigenous nations, especially in, in the Atayala region. Um, and they have a very different relationship to, to nature. The Bunong uh, nation, uh, which caused the top of Taiwan, the, the Yushan, the Jade Mountain, uh, Sabiya, uh, or um, a, a long-lived spirit of which we're just temporary stewards of, um, again, speaks to sustainability, not in SDG terms, but, but in their own terms, uh, where gender is maybe not very important for a mountain spirit. Um, and so my, my whole point is that these artificial um, categories uh, may be useful illusions temporarily, uh, but they cease to be useful illusions if you look at, at it from a transcultural identity, uh, which Taiwanese more and more identify ourselves, not in any particular culture, but really in this process of transculturalism. Very good. Fascinating. Thank you so much. I wonder, can I go back to the question of trust? So you, you were mentioning the idea of, of fun and openness, various ways in which you've tried to build or rebuild trust between citizens and the state. Again, Th thinking less so perhaps about pure democracy and more about service delivery and, and the way that citizens look at the state, what, what lessons are there for a country like the United Kingdom or a city like London as it, as it tries to find a way back uh, to rebuilding trust with, with citizens? What, what techniques has Taiwan used that others can learn from? Well, definitely trust the social sector, place the data stewardship and the joint data controllership, that's a GDPR term, um, to the social sector. And when the social sector owns the data, produces the data, curates the data, that's when the social sector can feel empowered enough to negotiate its own terms. There's many different words for that as a coalition, collaborative, or co-op, or union, or trust. Uh, I lose count. But anyway, the idea is that instead of surveillance capitalism or authoritarian intelligence, we make sure that our AI is a assistive intelligence and people can understand that they are crowdsourcing the data. Now, this is, of course, all very theoretical. So maybe I will just use one very short uh, anecdote to uh, illustrate the point. In early um, April, there was a case when uh, a person was diagnosed with COVID. And the first day she took contact tracers, she stay at home, meets nobody. She doesn't know how she contracted the disease. The next day, she finally admitted that she works as a professional um, you know, waitress in the intimate to such workers, especially in the time of the pandemic. So there's a lot of clamoring um, in the you know, so anti-social media uh, for the Central Everyday Command Center to invoke sanctions, to put them in jail, to find a large amount of fine and close down them and things like that. But uh, all it would do, it, had we uh, gone that way, is to force them to go underground as in the prohibition area and make the pandemic even more unpredictable. And quite fortunately, 
uh, we understood the idea of federated data controllership, and uh, the CECC people, some expert like Philip Law, work with HIV plus communities for decades. And so we devised a real contact system, as long as people could be contacted in case of transmission. They don't need to collect their real names, and none, no, none of the data need to be uh, submitted to the state. Um, and so we just explained the physical distancing rules. Hello, everyone. My, my apologies for these technical slight uh, uh, snafus, but anyway, we're back. I was just, a uh, final question for Audrey on the pandemic was about this um, vision of Taiwan's uh, enabling technological state, which um, clearly has elements that are, are bottom up, involve open data, use community groups. But, but I suppose I wanted to ask, is there not also lying behind this a more top down uh, mm -hmm. Um, dare one say, autocratic state that is working hand in glove with, with the more um, experimental and open vision that, that you suggest, just to give us the full picture? Sure. Uh, right after SARS uh, in 2003, our constitutional court said that because uh, we had to lock down the Hoping Hospital unannounced for an indefinite amount of time, it was barely constitutional. It would be unconstitutional if that nobody knew what uh, to do, right? So the constitutional court charged the legislature to not only set up the enabling acts for the Central African Command Center, but also devise a way of quarantining that are constitutional and has a very fixed amount of time for privacy or freedom of movement limitations. So of course, there is a mandatory quarantine. If you go back to Taiwan, you either go to the hotel for 14 days of physical quarantine, or if you stay at home with your own flat and bathroom, then you can put your phone, or if you don't have a phone, we give you one for a couple of weeks, to the digital quarantine, in which case we do not collect new data. Uh, our rule of thumb is that we never collect new data that we are not already collecting before the pandemic. But based on the signal strength alone, the telecoms know to a 50 meter radius uh, degree whether your phone has broken quarantine or not. And so if your the phone has uh, escaped out of that area, then the medical officers and you got a SMS automatically. It's the same thing as a earthquake warning or a flood warning or forest fire warning, except of course that uh, medical officers, if they actually found that you broke the quarantine, then instead of the 30 euros per day stipend that we pay for your collaboration, you pay us back in a thousand times that as a fine, so you can fund a thousand more people. And of course, there is this is mandatory. You can't opt out of it. You either go to the physical or to digital quarantine. Very good, very good. Let's um, let's broaden things out away from the pandemic to a few other questions that I think might interest um, our, our audience here at the Center for London. One of which is about the future of cities. So. Taipei is one of Asia's most vibrant cities, certainly one of its most vibrant democratic cities, um, uh, uh, attracting business from Hong Kong, uh, generally seen as a kind of bastion of, of freedom around the region. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the decline of cities in the aftermath of COVID-19. I wondered how does that look from, from a city like Taiwan? Is that same narrative about, uh, about cities coming under pressure present in Taiwan? And how do you see the future of urbanization as viewed from East Asia? Yeah, uh, once the high-speed rails in Taiwan begin functioning, um, the entirety of Taiwan, or at least the west side of it, uh, functions like a larger municipality. From the northmost uh, city of Taipei to the southmost metropolis of Kaohsiung, it's just one hour and a half of high-speed rails. Uh, and so it's, it's all very much connected together. When people in Tainan made those medical mask availability and so on, they never need to travel to Taipei because we always know that they're just one hour away in high-speed rails and the video <laughs> company works quite well anyway because in Taiwan, um, unlike other places, broadband is a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second for just 16 euros per month for unlimited data connection, it's my fault personally. Uh, and so um, because of this, uh, the urban landscape feels very diverse. There's not much urban-rural um, distinction when it comes to the western side of Taiwan. Of course, the mountainous part, the indigenous nations, the more remote islands and so on, of course, uh, offers the cultural diversity and, in fact, is where the First Nations of indigenous people kind of rely on. Uh, but in the western side, I think, is merging into a larger kind of super metropolis. And, and so, in a sense, that, that vision of a, a kind of East Asian urbanization is not being, people aren't questioning that because of the pandemic, that, that moves on as it has before, the, 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 the sort of 
the, the fact that the, fu the future will continue to be urban as it was before? Well, I, I think in, in Taiwan, the point Taiwan. here is that we never had a lockdown. So even if we delayed the opening of schools for a couple of weeks to secure the mask and the hand sanitizers, um, we never really um, stopped the schools either. So I, I guess Taiwan is in a, a somewhat different path. Uh, and we're looking at uh, people, not a new normal, but rather the old normal augmented digital. Uh, and this uh, offers more or less the same um, urban um, movement trend, as you were saying, but without the showing off, without the consumerism, without the excesses. Uh, all these has disappeared because it's just considered bad taste uh, when people are still suffering. So more sustainability, more circular economy. Uh, this thing that I'm wearing is made out of coffee bean waste and recycled plastic bottles, and these are, are becoming much more fashionable. It looks, uh, looks very fashionable, I must say. I need to get myself one of those. One final question, then we're going to go over to questions from the audience. We've got some interesting ones, um, which I'll try and rattle through in a minute, which is about China. So I think in you know one of the ways that Taiwan is most visible on the global stage is because of its tense relationship with China. And it would be interesting to hear you say something about that. But I was particularly interested in the, the way in which technology is being used to unite um, anti-Chinese or anti-authoritarian movements around Asia. So the Hong Kong street protests in Taiwan and in Thailand, the, it's now called the Milk Tea Alliance. I, I wonder if you could say something about that and, and whether you see uh, technology in these democratic movements as having an important role to play as people grapple with the rise of China as a, as a phenomenon. And then I'll go to questions from the audience. Yeah, I think the Milk Alliance is fundamentally about open innovation, right? The the milk could be soy milk, right? It could be any kind of milk. Uh, it could be rooibos, um, far as I'm concerned. Uh, when we're talking about bubble tea, it doesn't matter whether the tapioca is black or white. Um, and so the, the whole thing about the Milky Alliance is about the uh, affirmation of plurality uh, and uh, affirmation instead of a technological singularity or an authoritarian singularity, that we're, we're happy about plurality. We're happy about a internet of beings, not just things. We're happy about collaborative learning, not just machine learning. We're happy about shared reality, not just isolated virtual realities. We're happy about making the state transparent to the people, not the people transparent to the state. As you rightly pointed out, that is stark contrast with authoritarian intelligence. Ours is of a assistive intelligence. Very good, very good. Let me let me turn to a few a few questions from uh, from our audience here in London, or not? I'm in Singapore, but um, here's a question. So Richard asks, does Taiwan engage in participatory budgeting, and uh, if so, how does how does that work in Taiwan? Yes, it works in many levels. Uh, city council level works in the municipal level. Uh, there's the PB dot Taipei uh, on the district level in the Taipei city, uh, and in, arguably in a national level with the regional revitalization uh, plan. And so, yeah, we have PB in all levels. And and so Ben Rogers, the director of the Center for London, also asked a similar question, which is. What about neighborhood and local government in Taiwan? Um, so he also asked about participatory technology, but in a sense, is Taiwan's system of government, is it centralized as in the UK, or, or does this vision of decentralization extend to, to local um, government as well? Yeah, the, the six um, kind of autonomous municipalities um, all have their <clears throat> own system of uh, direct participation. In fact, uh, at the end of the year of Sunflower Movement 2014, specifically uh, the mayor of Taipei, Ke Wenzhe, uh, and also mayor of Tainan, uh, Lai Qingde, now our vice president, um, both campaigned on an open government direct democracy uh, platform and won uh, because of it. Actually, uh, at the end of that year, anyone who was against um, citizen participation lo lose their election. Um, and so it's, it's a very, hip thing uh, to, to say and do. Uh, and we launched our national action plan for open government, not only in the administration, but also in the legislation, uh, as well as part of open parliament uh, network work. So yeah, it's, it's a fashionable thing uh, to engage in citizen participation. And our work in the national government is twofold. First is to uh, amplify the better and best practices 
just like the voluntary local reviews of SDGs of the Taipei City, New Taipei City and Taoyuan City to our international audience, but also learn from the better practices from like literally better Reykjavik uh, from Iceland, uh, the PB from Madrid and Barcelona, Polis from Seattle and things like that, and integrate that, the latest invention being quadratic voting and funding from the Ethereum community into our presidential hackathon. And so our work in national government is not a top-down role, it is a facilitative and bridging role. Very good. Um, uh, I, I, the, I, that, that last bit about uh, Ethereum, I think we, we might leave for another day. Um, how can, so uh, we have a question from Anonymous, but uh, uh, they know who they are. So how can Londoners be encouraged to take more responsibility for their own data, as it seems like citizens in Taiwan do? So you, you mentioned individual personal data. Um, what's Taiwan's approach to that and what can cities like London learn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it's just about uh, in the primary schools, making sure that you teach about competence, not literacy. Um, our curriculum has totally changed starting last year, uh, replacing all the occurrences of media literacy, data literacy, digital literacy with the term competence, uh, because literacy assumes that they are consumers of narratives produced by the few, but actually many primary schoolers probably has more Instagram followers than I do, right? So they are the media, they produce their own data. They purchase the um, air boxes uh, from the primary school teachers. Um, each class maybe maintain one, one box uh, to measure the PM 2.5 levels of air quality and contribute to the um, distributed ledger uh, that uh, monitors the air quality. They engage in citizens initiatives. Some of our most uh, active citizen initiatives are proposed by people in high schools, for example, banning plastic straws for bubble teas. Um, it, it sounds like, you know, a challenge to our national identity drink, but it actually uh, is the thing and then uh, gets ratified. Uh, and so the point is that before they turn 18, they already have plenty of experience, not only producing data, but also producing suitable designs that can turn those data into worked and also working prototypes that then gets picked up by the citizens' initiatives, the participatory budgeting and participatory rulemaking systems, and none of which require citizenship. Uh, it only requires residentship. And even if you're just 14 years old, you're welcome to participate. Very good. We've run up against our time at the top of the hour, but if you, do you, Audrey, do you have a couple more minutes? We have two, two, two or three more questions. If you, sure, if you have time I, to them. I have maybe, maybe five more minutes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, that's great. That's all, all we need. So there was one question. I think maybe bouncing off your, your answer about uh, inclusivity and diversity, um, which is how do you try and be inclusive of, of those with disabilities, especially in the digital world? Uh, in, in Taiwan. So maybe could, could you give us an insight onto that and then and I'll ask one further question and then we'll close. Sure. Uh, in 2016, we uh, made the Linux Foundation open API standard while well, it's still in beta, uh, our national standard. Uh, meaning that uh, in Taiwan, when you procure a digital service, if the vendor says, oh, I can only produce it for people with sight, but not for people with seeing difficulties, they could get disqualified for failing the accessibility requirement and being discriminatory, right? Uh, but then we amended the procurement rules uh, four years ago saying uh, for all the human interactions, you also have to provide open API according to the OS3 standard. If you charge us too much for it or say that you can't do it, well, well, then um, the vendor could be, you know, disqualified by saying that they're discriminating against robots. We, we don't quite say that, but that's the end effect. And so because of the open APIs, it enabled people who want to translate into a different language, who want to make an experience that works better with screen readers or any sort of assistive technology, not to rewrite the entire website or entire digital service, just uh, reading the APIs, accessing the, the APIs. And that's why the mask availability map ends up having more than 140 different applications. It's because each serves a particular need for a certain group of people. Very good. Final question. So this was uh, Claire Harding. This was the one that got the most upvotes um, on our questions, which was a very simple one. So earlier in this conference, 
the Centre for London hosted uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan, um, the Mayor of London. And so the final question was, if you had one single piece of advice for London ma London's mayor based on Taiwan's experience of managing the pandemic, what should it be? What, uh, what if you if you were uh, if you yourself were the mayor of London, then what can a city like London learn from Taiwan's experience? The most important lesson. Well, it's the Pygmalion effect. If you maximally trust the citizens and the social sector, then the social sector become your most trustworthy partner. But if you do not trust the social sector and your citizens, they become less trustworthy and also less trusting of each other. So your choice. Very good. Okay, thank you. This has been a delightful conversation. I've been looking forward to this very much. Uh, the work that you do is um, uh, both interesting and, and inspirational. So I, I wish you all the best of it. Thank you very much for coming uh, virtually, at least, to London this afternoon uh, to share a little bit uh, of that. So thank you very much and hope to, to see you personally uh, or in physically uh, in London uh, at some point soon. So thank you very much, Audrey Tang. Let me hand back. Yes, live long and prosper.